Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Reagan Canope. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. So Measure H was an initiative in Los Angeles County, sort of brought forward operational housing support services. As you continue to expand a shelter system, you are in essence increasing the choices of temporary shelter in a region. Sort of the immediate effectiveness on literal homelessness is probably less than I think most observers of this public policy area would assume. All right, folks, this week we are very pleased to welcome John Taponia to the podcast. Uh, most of our listeners are probably familiar with who John is, but if you're not, uh, John is associated most closely with Echo Northwest, which is a large economic consulting firm um, based in Oregon. Uh, it focuses on economic development, fiscal policy, housing, workforce, education, uh, and social policy. Uh, John arrived in 1997 at Echo Northwest. He's worked with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Oregon Business Council, uh, many state agencies and local governments, not just across Oregon, but across the United States. Uh, he was also in the Peace Corps, which we talk about a little bit in the episode. Uh, and he used to work at the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office. Um, but the this podcast is about housing and homelessness. Uh, we're going to link in the show notes to the full report that we're referencing in this episode. It's called Postcard from the Future, What Portland Can Learn from the Implementation of Los Angeles's Measure H. And this is all about housing and homelessness. Uh, basically, Measure H is a was a uh, funding mechanism very similar to the Metro Supportive Housing Services Bond. Um, and there were some uh, what the report calls missteps by Los Angeles in the implementation of this measure. Um, so I think this is really useful and critical information for people in Oregon politics who want to understand homelessness and housing policy, particularly as we, you know, navigate the issue in the legislative session. This was huge in the campaign trail. Like, um, if you want to understand and follow what's happening on homelessness and housing policy, I think this is a good sort of baseline level of understanding um, for folks to have. Uh, so it's a it's a you know, the, the second half of the episode is where we start talking about the six recommendations. Um, so make sure you listen to those six recommendations. That's the real juicy, meaty part. The beginning is, I think, useful context that will help people understand um, the why of those six recommendations, but the recommendations are really important. Um, really enjoyed the episode. I hope you all enjoy it too. Uh, but if not, we'll give it another shot next week uh, when we're back with a new episode. Thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you here again soon. All right, John Taponia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, so we are very excited to talk to you. Um, obviously, housing and homelessness are two of the biggest issues, if not the two biggest issues heading in to the legislative session, but also they were two of the biggest issues on the campaign trail. Like this is, these issues have been front and center in Oregon politics um, and they're really complicated. So you wrote a paper that we're gonna dive into in a second, but before we do that, um, Tell us a little bit about yourself. How so? Your most people know you from your time leading Echo Northwest. Um, when when did you when were you leading that organization again? I started leading the organization in two thousand nine, uh, but I've had a couple of different stints here. I worked uh, out of their Eugene office uh, right after I graduated from the University of Oregon back in nineteen eighty seven. Okay. Uh, until 1989, and then uh, went off to grad school, Congressional Budget Office and the Peace Corps, and then came back in 1997 and started a social policy practice at ECHO, um, built that practice up, uh, it, it continues uh, today, and then and then became president in 2009, uh, bought the company with some folks uh, from the founder, Ed Whitelaw, and partners in 2012. And then I sort of stepped down and sold sold my shares uh, last year. Uh, first, where was your where was your Peace Corps mission? I was in Chile. Oh, no! Okay. Do you speak so, Spanish so, fluently? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I think that was better uh, twenty five years ago. I can still, you know, jump in a taxi and get to where I need to go and those kinds of order stuff at a restaurant. Um, but it that that was fascinating. It was. Uh, it was right after Pinochet had stepped down. So it was 1990. Oh, no kidding. 
five, he had his plebiscite in 91, I believe. And he was still uh, uh, a factor. He was on the um, joint arms committee uh, and then also a member of the Senate. Oh my and they gosh. Had sort of sort of created this aftermath of, of his leadership where he and I think six of his friends were permanent uh, appointees to the Senate. So they, you know, you had sort of a voting block there. Uh, so he, he, he loomed large, uh, and it was just a fascinating time to be in that country as they tried to get back into a democracy out of autocracy. Yeah. That's interesting. We'll save that for another podcast perhaps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and then, so brief overview, what does echo Northwest do and who, who do you serve? Who do we serve? Yeah, so it was founded, it's coming up on 50 years, founded by Ed Whitelaw, University of Oregon economics professor back in 1974. And basically what his uh, idea was, was he, he was in academia and he was looking at way too many public policy issues that weren't benefiting from academic studies or findings. And so he sort of cut a deal with uh with the department down at uh, the University of Oregon and said, how about if I'm kind of the outward facing uh, connector to um, governments uh, and try to bring our economic toolkit in more into um, public sector thinking uh, and pulled that off, started the firm, uh, started the firm. It was originally sort of focused on uh, urban uh, planning, urban development, and natural resource issues. Uh, we expanded into deeper work in transportation, sort of more sophisticated uh, tolling and congestion pricing work, uh, did a fair bit of work in the utility sector. And then I joined in, in 97 and sort of gradually brought in education projects uh, and welfare related work. Uh, we're going to resist Reagan's temptation to ask you about tolling because I know he's a big fan of state tolling. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a joke. Um, so, OK. <laughs> OK, so uh, the report is called Postcard from the Future. What Portland can learn from the implementation of Los Angeles's Measure H. Uh, I think this is a really important report for people to read. We're going to talk through why that is. Um, but first baseline level, what is Measure H? Uh, what is Measure H? What's the story of how it came to be in Los Angeles? Right. So Measure H uh, was a, was an initiative uh, in Los Angeles County, uh, passed in 2017, uh, and sort of brought forward operational uh, housing support services. So a combination of um, either short-term vouchers to help individuals sort of rapidly try to get back into, into housing out of homelessness, uh, mixed with some long-term vouchers, uh, where you may have uh, not time-limited uh, rental subsidies together with um, substance abuse services, uh, workforce development help, things of that nature. Uh, and then some, some just uh, temporary shelter uh, funding as well. So, you know, as uh, as many know, Los Angeles County, just in terms of the sort of the share of the population that is literally homeless uh, on a given night, uh, those rates are very elevated down there. And in particular, sort of like Portland and much of the West Coast, uh, uh, a very high share of the literally homeless population is unsheltered. So they're not in a congregate shelter or um, some kind of temporary housing, uh, literally on the street in tents. So my my last follow-up and then I'll hand to Reagan is, this is like the, the loaded question that the report is actually about, is Measure H working? And to what extent and in what ways and in what ways is it not working? What did you find when you were looking at Measure H's implementation? Yeah, I guess the cleanest way to answer that question is if you asked the public if they thought it was working, uh, they they would say no, uh, that um, it, it had spent uh, well over a billion dollars over the first four to five years of its implementation. And if you looked at public polling, 
recently, uh, sort of last year, early uh, or, or early last year, uh, LA folks said not only were things not getting better, but they perceived the crisis as getting worse. worse. Uh, and it was very much like, I mean, if, if, if you read the papers down in, in Los Angeles, the, the sort of the the, the press uh, around a campaign, you just see an awful lot of similarities to the way that the campaign sort of played out uh, at the governor's race in Oregon with uh, homelessness and housing at the very top of the list and mm -hmm. nothing that was very close in terms of second. Reagan? Um, so what do you, uh, I think one of the things that will be important for our listeners to know, and maybe will help educate me a little bit is what's the difference between homelessness services, homelessness prevention services, and, you know, are, are these particular approaches working? Um, and then I'll ask you kind of a quick follow-up about some more Oregon specific policy. Yep. So HUD has, um, very specific, uh, categories of homelessness uh, that are in sort of federal statute and, and regs. And so there is uh, the sort of the first category is literally homeless, which, which means that you are either in a temporary shelter that has been provided by the government or a nonprofit organization that's not that you're not intended to live in permanently, uh, or you are living someplace that is not meant for human habitation. Uh, on the street in a tent, in an RV, in a car, uh, that kind of, so that is literally homeless. That is what the is, is sort of the every other year uh, point in time count mm -hmm. is attempting to, to measure. Uh, then there is uh, imminent risk of homelessness, and there's a very specific definition of that. I believe it's 14 days. Um, and uh, the individual or the household is deemed to be at very high risk of becoming homeless or, or losing their housing if, if there isn't an intervention. That's where your sort of preventative services would be targeted. Uh, then there is a third category that is a much broader definition. Uh, there are many different uh, references to homelessness in different uh, federal agencies. And so, for example, in schools, uh, schools will do measure uh, measures of homelessness that are broader. Mm -hmm. uh, so if a student doesn't have a permanent address, uh, mm -hmm. then, but maybe they're living, uh, I don't know, with a friend of the family uh, and they don't have a permanent address, uh, they would be considered homeless by the definition of the McKinty-Vento uh, Act. And, and, and then, any number of other federal agencies that would have those uh, broader definitions of being doubled up or um, in an un unstable uh, housing situation. And then finally, there's a fourth category of fleeing domestic violence uh, that is uh, that rounds out the major categories of the of the HUD homelessness. So starting with, I think that probably the homelessness services mostly aren't targeted that last category, right? The domestic violence stuff is a little bit more specific and specialized, right? So we're mostly talking about those first two categories, right? Which is someone who is uh, literally doesn't have any kind of dwelling, no rental, no home that they own. Um, and then the second, which is those who are at risk of becoming homeless, having their house repossessed or being removed from their rental um, for whatever reason, right? Yep. So what... Um, what types of like specific services, um, maybe an example from each category of a type of service that is that that governments generally provide in those situations? Because I think maybe a lot of right. people uh, don't know, like what kinds of homelessness and what kinds of services are out there right now that that we've that we at least offer or attempt to offer at this point. Absolutely. No, great question. And this will will step through this carefully uh, because there's. <laughs> Quite a bit to work on here. Uh, so, uh, so if you if if you think about uh, sort of literal homelessness as being uh, sort of the state that we're trying to uh, change and reduce, then you've got uh, you have people flowing into that, an inflow into that uh, condition, and and then you have a potential programs that would 
attempt to accelerate the outflow. Uh, and, and, and we have programs that have been tested in sort of scientifically through randomized controlled trials that have been proven to reduce both the inflow and to increase the outflow. So that's not always the case in public policy uh, that we have uh, evidence-based uh, rigorous scientific uh, studies of these, but in this particular case, we do. And that, and that, is, and that is good news. Um, the sort of less good news is that the sort of the immediate effectiveness on literal homelessness is probably less than I think most uh, observers of this uh, of this public policy area would assume. And so let's take the let's let's take the eviction prevention uh, program, which is being funded uh, through the Metro measure. Uh, the best sort of national rigorous study that's been done on this was a, pro a study of a program in New York City. It was conducted by APT Associates, uh, and it was of a program called Home Home Base. And so this was, uh, you know, a program where you would go try to find people in that second category of imminent risk, uh, and you would um, you would sit down with some combination of sort of service referrals and maybe helping them sort of, you know, counsel the, through a uh, problem solving. And then there might be a little bit of financial assistance to help them pay in arrears on their rent, uh, or maybe they have arrears on their utility bill, et cetera. And uh, it was just sort of looking at the numbers before I jumped on here. If you sort of adjust for inflation, that was a an intervention that was about three thousand dollars per uh, per treated household, okay. combination of case management and direct sort of financial support. So um, it, when you did the sort of randomized trial and you looked at how things turned out, the treatment group uh, very successfully stayed out of shelters. That was what they were sort of measuring. Did people end up uh, using shelters? And in that case, uh, about 8% of the uh, of the households who had gone through this program ended up in a shelter, which, which that's a good outcome, a uh, very mm. low percentage. Mm. The, the, the problem with the, with the sort of the hydraulics of this intervention is that if you went and looked at the households that weren't treated at all, it was about 14% ended up in a shelter. So still a relatively low share ended up uh, using a shelter after after the after the fact. And um, you know that sort of boils down to the uh, just you know how much uh, in, individuals and households will do to sort of avoid <laughs> literal homelessness. Yeah. Uh, if uh, if they aren't given that support, maybe they will press harder into families and friends, and uh, I, I don't know, maybe maybe borrow money or maybe ask for some relief there and go uh, double up uh, and 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 live with uh, live with relatives for a period of time, or I don't know, leave the region uh, and 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 try to find some different opportunity, et cetera. Hmm. So. Uh, so that program was both effective um, in, 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 you know, in a randomized trial treatment, um, but you had to come across about a uh, hundred interventions to reduce the literal entry into shelters by about six, which would be the difference between mm -hmm. the treatment and control. So that's that that that's that's where the challenge comes there then um then if we move over to uh outflows the evidence-based intervention there is is housing first uh which people talk an awful lot about and and also has been subjected to randomized trials um, there have been trials up in Canada uh, in multiple cities. There have been trials with a, a HUD uh, program for veterans 
that is specifically targeted to veterans uh, with have been diagnosed with some form of mental illness. And then there's been uh, a family options uh, program that had evaluated that that looked at at families that were accessing this this housing first. John, real yeah. quick, can you, can you just define housing first uh, before you go on? Yeah, so the, I was about to ask that. Right. So how basically housing housing first means that uh, the offer of housing um, comes before the requirement for some kind of um, substance abuse treatment or uh, enrollment in, in in some kind of uh, personal care programming uh, that, that in, in order to work on any of those personal issues, the theory is uh, housing has to be stabilized first and that a flaw of the previous methods uh, to try to work on those issues before you offered housing is that it just didn't, it didn't work in that direction. Uh, people needed to have stable housing in order to work on their work on their other issues. So again, uh, all three of those studies that I mentioned, the one in Canada and VASH and, 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 and uh, family options in, in the United States um, show that this is, an, uh, this is effective uh, in sort of sharply reducing literal homelessness and you know, over a long period of time, if you sort of look at 24 to 36 months later, uh, keeping the uh, the treatment group out of literal homelessness and and and, and stabilizing situations, like the eviction prevention program, the problem comes in the counterfactual, uh, and that is that even at entry to the program, the control group and the treatment group. While they they can be deemed chronically homeless, and they are chronically homeless, they're homeless a lot. They are not literally homeless all of the time. Hmm. So, uh, if if I'm reading the literature correct uh, in the Bash program, for example, um, for the 90 days preceding entry into that program. Uh, the treatment and control uh, individuals were literally homeless about a third of the time. Uh, mm. An awful lot, but not literally all the time. So what were they doing in some of the other parts of the time? Well, some of the other times they were doubled up with relatives, or they may be in a hospital <laughs> being treated, or they may be in a drug treatment center uh, and off the mm. street, or they, you know, they potentially could be incarcerated mm -hmm. uh, if you go back into time. So so literally taking a person and handing them a long-term voucher and successfully getting them into um, into permanent housing uh, is is wonderful for that individual, but that does not mean that every day that they're in that permanent housing, the counterfactual would have been uh, that they were on the street or in a in a temporary shelter. Uh, Are you? Are you basically saying that the the program was a little bit like self-selecting in the sense that the people who participate in the program were more likely to have access to, I don't know what you call it, more services and stuff like that, and therefore are less likely to be as chronically homeless as other groups? Or maybe I'm not understanding you correctly. No, no, it's just, I, I think it's almost just the very nature of even of, of chronic homelessness. Yeah. Uh, is that it is a it is a much more dynamic state than you're on the street or uh, ninety you're in days house. in a row, yeah. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and you know I can be out there a lot, but not out, not out there every day. Uh, the, the the other issue becomes is that as you follow that program over time, so remember this about a third of the time at entry, they were the same. Uh, and then the treatment group falls to close to zero because now they've got a housing voucher and hopefully they're holding on to it and they they stay off the streets and out of shelters. But gradually, as you follow the control group, they are less likely to be literally homeless over time. Something something happens in in their in their life. Maybe maybe good things, maybe bad things. It's possible they end up being incarcerated. It's possible they end up dying. It's possible they uh, end up in a um, uh, permanent housing, you know, on their on their own accord, et cetera. But gradually, that sort of 
you, you can see the graph, it sort of falls very sharply for the group that got treated. But then for the for the control group, it sort of gradually falls down. The literal homelessness gradually falls down over the course of three years. So if if I take if if I take this um, housing first piece and I say, okay, what's a good rule of thumb in terms of if I'm spending money on housing first, how much is that going to affect literal homelessness? The rule of thumb that uh, Dan O'Flaherty, uh, Columbia University uh, professor, suggests, uh, and I would consider to be sort of the leading the leading economist on this topic, uh, that you treat about 100 uh, individuals and you should expect your point in time count or your literal homelessness to fall by about 20. Um, wow. So uh, before we go on from there, I want to underscore my reading from your report about measure H before we, tra we transition to talk about the Metro, the, the Portland Metro. Sure. Housing. Sure. So I believe that what the report is saying, and it's not saying good or bad, this is good or bad. This is what the report is saying is that quote, homeless services and quote, homelessness prevention services do not directly reduce the number of people who are literally homeless. So this gets to your point about like the perception is that measure H is failing. It's based on this, like what people, people are not seeing a reduction in people living on the street, even though those two categories of investments, homeless services, homeless services and homelessness prevention services are doing good within the system and they're helping people. It's not reducing what is the most visible um, symptom of the uh, the broader homelessness spectrum is that an accurate way of reflecting what you're saying or do you I think at the very beginning I, I i think i recall you in the very beginning saying they don't work i would say they both do work <laughs> in reducing the number of people who are literally homeless yeah okay. you know you, you know uh, with uh, eviction prevention it's three to 100 you reduce it by six it's yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, i see it, it, with housing first it's three to 100 and reduce it by 20 that is an effect so it's not that they uh, don't work. It's just that it, it's the scale of the intervention would have to be significantly more than even the large scale of Measure H to visibly reduce street homelessness. And and it would have to be deployed with, I think, with more more intention and and and, and focus on what its goal is. <laughs> um, okay. Right. Um, so because... so so the way that O'Flaherty puts it is. These are these are not as effective in reducing literal homelessness as most people might think, okay. but they are the only tools we have in <clears throat> work. Okay, so so then let's let's take so we've talked about Measure H. What yeah. are the similarities and differences between Measure H and the Metro Supportive Housing Services Bond? They're very similar, in, okay. in so similar that uh, people from Portland flew to Los Angeles to sort of study what they were doing uh, and, and modeled, modeled this effort after, uh, after Los Angeles. It is, it is larger on a per capita basis uh, than Los Angeles. And, you know, for anybody who wants to know the details on that, that's, that, that's in the report, but um, we did, you know, uh, end up, raising amounts of money that on a sort of per capita basis, uh, however you want to define it, are are larger than the uh, LA intervention. Got it. So um, I want to kind of pivot to uh, what Mayor Wheeler um, has proposed and uh, for housing, and then also read kind of this line from um, from the report. It says, quote, a sizable emergency solution like the sanctioned encampments would encounter its own difficult math. Evidence from New York City suggests an expansion of an emergency system could reduce street homelessness, but could also result in an overall increase in the, the PIT count. And can you give us a quick definition on PIT count uh, before we go yeah. on? I mean, we're interchanging a little bit here, not not. Not perfectly, but but the point in time count is uh, something that uh, that it's done uh, in January in even numbered years. Typically, I mean, they call it on a single night. Sometimes it rolls over uh, a few nights, uh, where literally um, 
uh, volunteers go out uh, trained by uh, a nonprofit or academic institution and, and go out and attempt to count uh, all the people who are living in places not suited for human habitation. And, and so in that case, then it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm using that as a count of literal homelessness. Uh, so to get back to the quote, uh, the, um, the, and, and we don't have sort of the same kind of rules of thumb uh, that we do for housing first or for the eviction prevention. But uh, O'Flaherty's findings in New York, having looked at their attempts to expand emergency shelters, and they did sort of pretty dramatically over time, beginning in the 70s, there was a, a right to shelter uh, law that was passed. And so they you know, very quickly had to uh, come up with um, options, uh, temporary options for people that... Uh, they ultimately concluded that as you continue to expand a shelter system, you are in essence increasing the choices of temporary shelter, shelter in a region, both in mm -hmm. geography and probably also in the nature of the offering. <laughs> uh the the look and the feel of the place and the rules, mm -hmm. et cetera. And as you expand both the number, the geography, and sort of the offering, uh, his best bet would be you're probably going to increase the overall number of literally homeless people because you will draw people out of what are otherwise terrible existing housed situations. Mm. So, so <laughs> John. Not, yeah, go ahead. So do, so do you believe based on that research that the Ted Wheeler proposal of building these mass encampment sites would actually increase the number, at least a point in time count street homelessness. Like that, that's, it seems to be what the research is saying. The encampments could have an initial reduction, but an increase in the overall number. So I would, I, I would probably not go so far as, I mean, I, I obviously it has to do with the, what what are the nature of these camps? The design, where sure. are they located, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera? I would probably leave it at uh, they are certainly not going to reduce the point in time count or literal homelessness. That's the best that you're going to get. Uh, they will reduce the unsanctioned <laughs> camping, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but they uh, and and at 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 best. Uh, keep literal homelessness at the same number uh, at worst, put a little, put some upward pressure mm. on the overall count. Hmm. Well, and so you mentioned that point in time count and we had, I had some feedback um, on that from some rural kind of more conservative uh, members who say that the point in time count works pretty well or, or at least um, counts better in um, more urban areas than in more distributed rural areas where yeah. you may have yeah. some homelessness, but it's harder to count in those rural areas. And so there's yeah. the, 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 I guess maybe criticism or the request was that the point in time count not be the only metric because of the challenges that it faces for getting resources to rural communities. If that's what the governor's office is going to use and, and the, you know, the, because because there's there's communities outside of Portland in Multnomah County that still are experiencing also homelessness or even overspill homelessness from Portland, right? And so how do you how do you kind of you know the tracking is really difficult. I mean, Ben did an episode with uh, Alex uh, a couple months ago about that. It's just it's a challenge to track, and so it's a challenge to put the resources where they they're needed. Uh, absolutely, I couldn't agree couldn't agree more. Um, uh, point in time counts do rely heavily on on sort of skilled knowledgeable and um insightful uh volunteers <laughs> who, who have been trained I mean, literally if you if you imagine on a january night walking uh one o'clock in the morning into a health clinic that's a 24-hour health clinic and you walk in uh, what are you going to do uh, are you going to like go around and ask <laughs> The individuals who are sitting waiting for service. Yeah. Or, you know, or, do you have a place to go to tonight? Or you don't have a place to go? To? I mean, how do you approach that? 
It's a, yeah. and, and, and then just much harder, as you say, in, in rural areas, um, much more distributed uh, and harder, harder to count for sure. Okay. So now we have uh, entered the most important section of this podcast, which is the good news is this report ends with uh, six recommendations. Basically you identify some missteps that missteps, I think is your word that LA has made, but there are things that Portland can do. And I think the implication of this given looks like state actors are increasingly want to be involved in uh, these conversations around housing and homelessness, things that yeah. Oregon and Portland should be thinking about or focusing on um, if we actually want to avoid the missteps and improve outcomes. So I want to walk through those one by one. There's yeah. six of them. Um, the first one is remember that accelerated housing production is the long-term solution to the region's homelessness crisis. Uh, can you explain the the logic behind that statement? Yes. So there is this, I, you know, I think to this day, still an ongoing debate as to whether it is uh, uh, tightly constrained, overpriced housing is the is the main driver of this of this crisis, or is it something about personal circumstances and the increase in the fentanyl and meth epidemics, et cetera, that have that have driven this. If you look at where homelessness rates are the highest in this country. Uh, they are the highest in this country, up and down the West Coast, in Hawaii, and between Washington D.C. and Boston. And those are all tightly constrained, overpriced housing markets. If I were if I were going to try to make the case that it was fentanyl and and uh, high rates of disability, I'd go to Arkansas, Tennessee, uh, West Virginia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, very high rates of all those things, uh, but not especially high rates of, of homelessness. So my story on this Metro homelessness measure is it, it really is, it serves only as a bridge to try to get to a future yeah. where we made some progress on the overall production of, of housing. And if we sort of stumble through this decade uh, in the same way that we did the last decade, and are building 15 to 20,000 units in the state uh, uh, a year instead of 30 to 35,000, um, we're, we're never going to solve this problem. Uh, so qu qu quick follow up on that before we go to the next one. Did you watch the uh, Governor Kotek inaugural address? I read about it. I did not. I did. I did not actually watch it. So she's she one of the several, I think, headline items in that speech. But the most important one to me as I was watching this was a call to increase the yep. production of housing units to 36,000 units per year, which yep. she says in her speech is approximately an 80 percent increase over current production. I'm just kind of curious what your what your initial response to those kinds of numbers are. We I mean, at Echo Northwest, we do cartwheels. Uh, <laughs> We would, I mean, we're 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 in and around seventeen to twenty thousand uh, a a year for for the state. Even if you got into the high twenties and low thirties, uh, that would be a tremendous accomplishment. If if she can get it to thirty six, uh, go for it. Yeah. Mean, this is just a highly, a very tight. Um, there just aren't enough houses here for the number of people who want to live here. Period. Uh totally agree so so at the very least the targets are right now we have to figure out the how what are the yeah. levers we can push and pull to actually increase production and a lot of good legislation teed up uh on new ways to uh, calculate housing need uh and some resources to to fund infrastructure and help local communities uh get the capacity to sort of move through the permitting processes and mm -hmm. things like that Okay, recommendation number two is get clear and realistic about the relationship between housing placement activity and changes in the point in time count. You've talked about this a little bit, but can you give a little overview of why this is important? Yeah, well, if you if you go to the Metro website on the Supportive Housing Services uh, progress page uh, and you compare it to LA County's uh, progress on Measure H, the website's look substantially similar. They are counting. They're saying, look, here, we, we've served all of these households with, with eviction prevention, and, and we placed all of these uh, people in into housing. 
all of those are good things. And uh, those are lots of individuals who have, who probably have much more sort of stable situations right now than they would have had, uh, had the counties not found them and served them. However, uh, at the same time, the, the the counties and metro need to look at those numbers and understand if I serve a couple thousand, place a couple thousand households, realistically, what is that going to do to my literal homelessness count, uh, both sheltered and unsheltered, and, and likewise with the eviction prevention? Um, only to, because inevitably that is how the public is going to judge yes. progress on yes. this measure, regardless of what they put on their website. If 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 they do a fabulous job, uh, stably housing thousands of people, but do nothing on 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 the number of tents on the street, inevitably the the public will judge this as a as, as a failure mm -hmm. uh regardless of how much communications uh there are and uh and 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 then you would you would struggle to you know provide or pass any any additional services down the road if you needed to that totally makes sense um recommendation number three is establish a goal and timetable for reductions in street and shelter homelessness my question on this one is whose job is this is this the city of Portland? <laughs> is it Multnomah County? Is it Metro? Is well, that, it gets, down to the, that gets down to the last recommendation, doesn't it? And, that, <laughs> and, and, and that's if you ask Los Angeles, as I poked around in their uh, debate down there, I think that they would self-assess the lack of leadership or center, a sort of centralized focus as sort of a key to their um to their perceived lack of success so far that there isn't mm. anybody who's uh in in charge and has been sort of clear about what the measure is attempting to ac accomplish other than a whole lot of service delivery right and so uh you may be familiar with sort of the debates there were some very significant debates uh, in the middle part of last year between the Here Together Coalition and People for people Portland. People for Portland, yeah. And a couple of proposed, and we make reference to that in this paper, a couple of proposed but failed uh, initiatives to sort of redirect. Redirect, yeah. Guys will share the money uh, to, uh, to emergency shelters until, you know, there was some kind of improvement. R rather than sort of fight about how the money is being used my recommendation was okay let's let's get down and be clear about what we're trying to do with this resource mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and even though unsheltered homelessness should not be the only goal because there's a lot of good service going on and a, and a lot of lives that are being helped uh beyond any improvement in unsheltered homelessness uh but it has to be one of them and yeah. so and and so with good <laughs> math and modeling here together should say, okay, if we spend this much placing people into housing and doing eviction prevention, this is how much we think that much service with this much money is going to bring down the, 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 the PIT. Mm. Uh, and, and then somebody, and, and, and then somebody can come and say, well, that's not enough. <laughs> mm -hmm. Get it lower than that. So how are we going to, how are we going to further reduce it? So, um, I, that is so such helpful framing to me and that resonates so strongly with me. Um, but I think, so let's skip uh, four and five for a moment and go to number six, learn from LA's self-described systemic dysfunction and identify a central entity that is accountable for supportive housing services outcomes. Is there a best practice like governance model that you know, of? like what do you think should actually happen here? Or are you just saying like, Hey, figure it out, sit down and pick, pick how you're going to organize yourselves. Yeah, you know, the 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 closest thing that exists at the moment, and I don't know if it's something that can be built off of, is, is there there was an accountability function built into the metro measure. And there is a, I think it's a pretty sizable group um that is organized at the direction of Metro. 
to be paying attention to how this measure is being implemented and to, and to ask hard questions. That might be a place to start. Uh, but, uh, you know, my understanding is it's, it's maybe as many as, you know, 25 to 40 people. Wow. Uh, that's an awful lot of people. Yes. Uh, and I, I guess in terms of a best practice, I would, I would, I would, uh, separate steers and rowers, um, uh, in in the accountability that there should be steers should should be goal setters uh rowers should be the people who know how this stuff gets done are implementers uh but in term you know the, the the people who have no stake in how this money is set uh, is spent should provide some vision uh for for the goal and would that be uh, and hold the implementers accountable for helping uh helping meet that goal and the, the steerers would be the politicians the elected officials it could be politicians it could be you know trusted community leaders who are not elected okay. officials some combination of that uh but uh, but in terms of of the accountability function there shouldn't be individuals who have a stake in how the money is spent within their nonprofit for example mm -hmm. Um, so that, that would be a recommendation. Okay. Um, recommendation four: systematically manage the regions encampments and set public expectations that street homelessness will persist at gradually low levels. Uh, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I th that's simply a reaction, uh, to, I, I, I'm afraid the elected leaders, sort of set some kind of expectation that maybe we could wave a wand and it, this would all abruptly change very quickly, street homelessness. You might remember uh, about a year ago this time, Sam Adams proposed like a 3,000 person camp, I think, or two 1,500 person camps, yeah. which, you know, would assume some kind of very abrupt, quick, you know, everybody off the street all at once. And then... And, and then his critics sort of came up with, the, well, let's do the 3,000 unit challenge. Both of those are sort of in the mindset of a quick fix that mm -hmm. if we can do something really quick, we can go find these 3,000 units really, we just get everybody off the street immediately. And and that was frustrating to me because I just don't feel like that, that, that led the public along in this notion that, yes, all this money, I just paid my taxes and I should expect everything to get better very fast. Um, which I think is un just un practically uh, unrealistic. And so then I, I think if we, <laughs> if you had a clear plan about the time frame for improvement in unsheltered homelessness, and you were able to level with the public and say, look, this is going to take, this might take a couple of years, but you're going to see improvement over time. And this is what you should be looking for. And this is how we're going to report to you, et cetera. That then assumes that there is some amount of unsh unsheltered, unsanctioned homelessness that exists. So then you've got to sit down and say, well, okay, are we going to spend a little bit more money to make sure that it is organized and that it, it is working for the communities and the neighborhoods that are ending up supporting it? Right? Maybe there's some rule around how many tents can be together. Maybe there's some kind of a rule about how much material can be uh, held by any individual tent, uh, you know, as opposed to you've both seen it. Some some just get very, very, very large and mm -hmm. shopping carts and maybe a car park next to it and uh, pallets and yeah. et cetera. And so, you know, the way I've thought about this is that really are, are un- sanctioned unsheltered homelessness is our biggest system right we are serving it to some extent people are going out and doing outreach they are providing uh hygiene facilities in certain places and they are doing outreach for services etc well just if if that that is a system it's just not very well funded it's not very well organized and it's not working at all for the community. 
and 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 so treat that for as long as it exists. You need to treat that system a little bit more systematically. This this recommendation is the most fascinating to me, just from a political lens, because there's a question about whether politicians lead the public or the public leads politicians. And it will take a talented politician or politicians to do what you are saying should be done, which is to level set expectations. Because right now the public is saying we need to get rid of street homelessness. Like it is that that was the overwhelming message. I think most politicians heard in 2022 and you did not hear that I'm aware of politicians pushing back and saying, listen, here is a realistic set of expectations about a, here's a timeline. Um, here's the resources it's going to take to actually make progress. And oh, by the way, in the short term, we're actually not going to get rid of street homelessness because it's a physical impossibility. Um, I'm interested to see how the new folks who are who are going to be wearing these hats and a couple of folks who will be still wearing the hats um, are they going to are they going to pick up what you're putting down with this report and embrace it um that's just something i'm very interested to see yeah i mean whether whether or not they own up to it i think it is their reality uh mm-hmm. that that you know the the money for even if the the mayor's plan proceeds it already looks like it's moving more slowly than the original timetable they haven't received money from the county. They, you know, are in negotiations maybe with the state and others for uh, the resources that would be needed. I'm sure they're still trying to negotiate with non nonprofit uh, service providers that would operate a camp, et cetera. And 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 even if it did move along the schedule, he's not promising, you know, that it's implemented in, instantaneously. There already was many months uh, that it was going to take. So to some extent, he. He has said it's going to take time to get back to a point where ultimately his goal is to be able to enforce the the camping ban. See, and I don't want to get to it, like, but th- 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 there's, a ten- there's a tension here that is also super interesting to me, which is we want politicians to be visionary and to set big goals and to drive us toward better outcomes. But we also want politicians when it, it's the Mario Cuomo uh, governing or uh, campaign and poetry governing pros. Like we want the big visionary goals, but we also can't uh, we can't build trust and effectively govern if we've made these campaign promises, which many people in Portland have over the years um, yeah. that are just totally unrealistic. So anyway, just an just an observation. Um, I know. Well, and I up, think, Ben, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I know. I think, Ben, that like the number one thing that you learn when you look at state government, when you look at local government, for the most part, there is no problem so big um, that you, uh, how am I trying to say this? All big problems uh, have all kinds of logistics related um, problems that you have to solve in order to get to the solution or at least be moving in the right direction. Um, jamming hundreds and and uh, of millions more dollars down those systems don't make them work any faster, really. Um, you can speed them up, but you usually sacrifice other things to do that, right? And so it's like, yes, obviously there's a need for more resources in, that, in, in housing. But I think what we learned from 110, Measure 110 on drugs was like, if you blow up the systems and start over without some sort of bridge to whatever the new thing is, like, doesn't matter how many resources are there, no one's going to use them. And, and, you know, like blowing up those old systems first, or even trying to transition to new systems without doing the level setting, isn't gonna, it, it it's not going to make it go any faster, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, that's what you're saying is like the accountability of the politicians level is, you have to say, this is going to take more than one reelection for me. And so how do I how do I prove that we've made progress without, uh, you know, costing, you know, me my election if, if the thing that I ran on as a politician was homelessness and fixing it. Right. And that's a challenge. Hmm. Uh, we could talk for a long time about this and maybe we should. Um, but the the last we're coming up on time. So, John, the last rec- well, the second to last recommendation, we've already done the last one is fully leverage a new relationship with the Built for Zero movement. We've done a podcast on Built for Zero uh, but yeah. for, for folks who aren't familiar. Can you explain a little bit about this recommendation? Yeah. So um, 
they, they, this is a national organization, uh, Community Solutions, uh, led by Roseanne Haggerty. Uh, she spoke at the uh, Oregon Leadership Summit this year. Uh, they have received, uh, because of progress they've made in some cities, uh, I think $100 million from the MacArthur Foundation to sort of spread out and do their work uh, in other cities. And they have a partnership with, with Portland, which is wonderful. Uh, at the heart of their theor theory of action is that you need much better sort of real-time data on, on your homeless count. You can't wait for every couple of years to, to know whether it's, you know, 4,000 or 5,000 uh, individuals, et cetera. And so what they look for is a sort of a by name <laughs> database uh, that, that is uh, readily updated more in real time so that you can you can case manage and understand the problem uh, in a much more sophisticated way mm -hmm. uh, and you know ha having thought about both their work but then uh thought about work that i've seen down in silicon valley silicon valley had something called a triage tool uh, where they had background information on a whole host of individuals uh, from health records to criminal justice records, uh, et cetera, and essentially would do predictions of how much they thought the individual might cost the public system if they weren't, you know, if the public system didn't intervene. Mm -hmm. And they had estimates everywhere between this individual might cost $100,000 in the next year, this individual might cost 20, and this individual is wow. probably going to resolve. Uh, so you need that kind of information in a with scarce dollars uh, because we can't, you know, you've got options between eviction prevention at three thousand uh, dollars, a rental subsidy at ten or eleven thousand dollars a year, to permanent supportive housing with sort of a rent subsidy plus services at maybe twenty five thousand dollars or more per year. Well, you you can't take twenty five thousand dollars a year and spend it on an individual that would otherwise cost you ten, or you're going to run out of money. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I think the sort of a really smart segmentation of the population and understanding, you know, what every individual needs in order to sort of move forward, um, and much with much more precision is is a key to this. Mm -hmm. Well, John, this has been incredibly insightful. Uh, really enjoyed the conversation. I hope people read this report. We will link to the report in the show notes um, and we'll keep talking about it. But uh, if folks are interested in in learning more or they want to reach out to you because they've got questions, what's the best way for them to connect? Uh, always through Echo Northwest. Um, if you go to the Echo Northwest website, you can uh, both find the report and uh, find a way to contact me. Awesome. John, thanks again for making time to chat with us. We really All appreciate right. it. All right. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. See ya.